What's up, guys? Today we're going to be talking about Cha-Ching! The White Luck Warrior by R. Scott Baker. So, guys, this is book number two in the Aspect Emperor series. And also, for those that don't know, this is going to be a Let's Talk spoiler video, not a spoiler-free review. So if you're looking for the spoiler-free review, I'll put a link in the description, and you can go check that bad boy out. This video is really for people that are fans of the series, those out there that don't know any better, <clears throat> and for me to get this stuff out of my head and into a video. All right? All right. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to just kind of state the obvious and just say, this is a big old book. This is a chunky, chunky old bad boy. It's a behemoth, and it's badass. This is probably one of my favorite Baker books uh, that I've read to date. So I, as big as it is, it didn't matter because I just chewed this thing up and devoured it. <clears throat> but that being said, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. And most assuredly, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to miss some stuff. But let's, that's why this is a Let's Talk video, guys. Like, feel free to comment away at anything I missed, or maybe if I get something wrong, blast away on that keyboard. In fact, the last video, some of your comments were quite helpful in uh, helping me along the way here in this uh, second apocalypse journey. So continue to, you know, keep in this thing with me, okay? Feel free to say whatever the fuck you want. Let's get into it. So right out the gate, I feel like Baker does something a little bit different with this book. As far as the rest of the books he's hit us with so far, really start out with a bang. I mean, they're like awe-inspiring, just grab your ass and bring you right into this just phenomenon. <laughs> but here in this book, the White, uh, the White Luck Warrior, we really just pick up from where we left off. But what he does is... He really adds a lot more weight and consequence to what has happened in the judging eye. And in fact, immediately reading this book, I began to appreciate the judging eye just straight out the gate, right away. And mainly because of this like state that our skin eaters are in. Like a commune, the and Maimara, and the skin eaters are out of Selagis, and they're going to make their descent into the mop. But before this, we're really just kind of sitting with them, and they're beat up. And the one thing that really, really, really impressed me is Sarl and just how he is deranged from these events that have unfolded, you know, inside Solages. And this is something I just appreciate because a lot of times in fantasy, it's only the physical, like, aspects that seem to threaten. If your character gets out unscathed, or maybe, you know, he loses a limb, but that's it. And then we're just pushing forward in the story. This is great because it's realistic in the fact that if you see these horrors unfold in front of your eyes, there's a good chance that you're not coming back from that. You're going to be fucked up in the head, and Sarl is most certainly fucked up in the head in the best ways. I love when he's just shouting out, the coffers, boys, the coffers, <laughs> in just the most random times. It's great. The next part of this book that really grabbed me and just pulled me in, and this is also when I knew that Baker's hooks were set and being set very deep. And this is just really right when we go into the great ordeal and we're dealing with Sorwheel and just his relationship there with the rest of the, you know, captured princes that have been dubbed the Scions. I do really like the way that this relationship is being handled between uh, Sorwheel and the rest of the, the Scions because they're kind of flipping him shit, right? After the events of what happened and he was kind of dubbed a believer king, the rest of the Scions really use that to flip him shit. And he's, you know, you know, part of this group. And But at the same time, there's all this kind of like pushback on him. And I kind of dug that. He's not exactly welcome right out the gate. He's got to kind of earn his stripes, so to speak, amongst the Scions. But they're not really willing him to give him the time of day to earn said stripes. And then also in this thread, what really, really grabs me is this conversation that starts to happen uh, in private between Proyas and Kellis. Now, for some of you who might not know, Proyas is one of the, my favorite characters in this series. He's somebody that I just love to watch his struggle. He's somebody that is just constantly trying to be like the perfect 
like the perfect faithful person, you know, trying to be old pious proyas, but it never really works out for him, right? Because he's always got, he's always hitting snags and he hates the fact when he can't be a true believer. All this stuff is just amazing to me. And this is also when I started to realize that Though the Aspect Emperor has taken a new direction and has a, a different tone than Prince of Nothing, Baker is beginning to weave in that philosophical tone that creates a lot of introspection in the reader. Baker does an amazing job as well as describing the trials and tribulations here of having such a massive army like the Great Ordeal. Much like he did a great job with the Holy War and how big it was and how it had to move forward, here in the Great Ordeal, we're seeing that this thing is so massive and it's basically consuming uh, supplies at such a rapid rate that they will starve before they even reach their destiny. So they're they have to come up with some tactics here and break up into foraging groups just so they can supply themselves and keep this thing going. This is also when we get that kind of concerning conversation between Proyas and Kellis where Kellis decides that we're going to cut off communication between the Great Ordeal and the Empire. But it's not just that bit of information because that alone is pretty, you know, cause for concern. But as well as he's really kind of hitting Proyas with bits of information that are heavy. One being that, you know, the state of the empire is almost inevitable, that the enemy is at the door and everybody else is out there in the fucking woods playing with wolves, you know what I mean? So things are not going to look good back in the empire. Now, when we pop back to the empire, we will see Fanal Cascamandri, his lone Kisharam sorcerer, as well as his, well, I'm not exactly sure what Malawibi, is it Malawebe? Malawibi? He's basically been sent, from what I understand, by his country kind of to oversee Fanal and make a decision if they want to back him in his war against the new empire. Now, I can be wrong about that, but that's what I believe Malawibe is there for. But he seems to be more interested in Fanal's Kisharam sorcerer more so than Fanal, even though Fanal, you know, he is... He's, there are things to respect about Fanal. There's also things that he doesn't like about Fanal. But this also brings some things together because we will begin to see Satma Nanaferi, the Yacht Work Cult, and Fanal Cascamandri kind of come together there. And this is, you know, where we're seeing as the reader, like, oh shit, forces are combining against our key players. Which then brings me to Esmanet and the Anasa Rimber children. So Esmanet, as we know, is the Empress now, and she is running the Empire. Kellis has left her in charge, and she is kind of going crazy over the whole deal, right? She, even though she is at her most, like, she is at the most powerful position she has ever been in in her entire life, she's also kind of the most vulnerable, and shit is just going wrong left and right. You got the Yatwer cult, you got Fanal Cascamandri beating at your door, it's just not looking good, and now your husband has cut off communication so you can't even fucking talk to the Aspect Emperor and things are just looking bad. And everyone's pointing at you or coming to you, asking you for questions, advice, or answers, and you got nothing for them. So you're very overwhelmed, just like Esmanette is, right? Oh, she is fucking just losing it. And, you know, the person that she usually confides in is becoming the person that she's mistrusting, Mathanet, her brother-in-law. So we see this whole thing kind of play out. And we know that there are... She has some reasons to kind of distrust Mathanet. For one, she's just kind of losing her shit, but he is Dunyaned, and that in itself is kind of reason to suspect. <laughs> but also, Kel Momus, at his actions have kind of been hidden, and now Mathanet is somewhat being blamed for the shit that Kel Momus has been you know, pulling. And Mathanet looks more and more suspect as we go forward. And this is really when we get introduced to Inrel is it Inrelatus? Inrelatus? So this is the other Anasarimber child who is crazy. He's being, you know, held in the fucking, uh, the Adamian Heights as a prisoner. And he is unhinged madman dude i really love him i i you know he's he's got that just crazy mind and he will really pull some very poetic shit out of the ether but then he's also a madman that whole part where it talks about him <laughs> fashioning a you know a prison shiv out of nothing but fabric and jizz i was like god 
damn in Relatus. In Relatus? I'm fucking sorry, guys. Some of this back and forth between Kel Momus and his brother is just five star material, though. There was a line that In Relatus says to his brother that just floored me, guys. And it was like, look at this heap of screams you call a world and tell me you would not add to them. Pile them sky high. And it's just like so fucking good. This is the best, like, poeticness of a madman to a brother who is also a madman, because that's the other thing, right? Inralatus can see his brother's bullshit. He knows he's lying to him. He could see, like, the soul of his, like, the brother that he slayed inside of him. It's nuts. This whole part is very, I don't know, man. It just hit me in the spirit, in the brain, and in the dark heart all at the same time. And it really brought this level of like intrigue with this new character. This is this book. I really started to get back on board with the Anasa Rember children. As you might may recall, I was very freaked out by them <laughs> in book one. Now, this is also around the time where Esmanette has her mistrust has just taken over and she can no longer truly trust Mathanette. And she is forced to basically bring her brother-in-law in front of her child in Relatus because he's the only guy that will be able to see through old Uncle Holy and really get down to brass tacks here. We can figure out if he's on board or off board. Now, popping back over to the Great Ordeal, we will see that the Scions have been basically assigned to forage for wild game. And we'll see that this is also where Sorwheel... We notice that he has some ability here out on the Estuli Plains because him being a prince of Sarcarpus, he actually knows some of the layout of the land here more so than a lot of our other players in the Great Ordeal. So he is at some kind of an advantage here and he's starting to notice things that other people are not. And this actually kind of reminded me a little bit of our Skilvindi barbarian, Neor Skiotha, uh, because he was one of those guys, right, that he, he was really picking up on shit that a lot of people just overlooked. And this is one of the things that really made me start to appreciate Sorwheel and his, you know, his ability to just ke like catch things with his eye. Because without him, surely many more would have died. Because we get to see this whole thing playing out with the Shrink. And this is also where I was like, damn, the Shrink are more than meets the eye. Up until this point, and you might have heard me talk about it in my last spoiler video in The Judging Eye about not really understanding the Shrank fully. Kind of thinking they were just mindless beasts, just savages. And maybe they are to some extent, but in this book we start to understand that there are some intelligent, you know, aspects to the Shrank. And they do have somewhat, like, style of tactics. And it also... You know, Sorwheel's really the one that, like, points out the fact that this is a consult ambush. You know, it's not just Shrank. It's the consult. So there's a lot of shit that goes into this whole deal. And it's kind of all happening real fast. And then we see that the, the Great Ordeal is being ambushed. And there's a whole swath of fucking Shrank south of them. We see that whole deal play out where people, they're actually, they're in battle. And this is one of my favorite parts about this is, though, we, we get that great-ass line. Death came, death came swirling down. And when I read this, the hairs on my arm stood up because it just brought me back, baby. This fucking line, I almost want to just get that shit blasted on me, tattooed, just because it's just like, it's so good. It's so good. Death came swirling down. Every time I hear that shit, I'm just like, fuck yeah, it did. And one of my favorite parts of this whole scene is just when the battle's kind of ended and Sorwheel is talking to Zaranga and he's just like, it's real. It's real. The Aspect Emperor's war is real because he's seen the Shrank now. He's seen all this stuff come at him. It's no longer just words out of the other men's mouth. It's a living, breathing enemy in his face. So he's just like, like blubbering. Oh, it's real. The war is real. The Aspect Emperor's war is real. And Zaranga goes, yeah, but are his reasons... And that shit was like, boom, to me, like if this was a show or a movie or like if this was a show, that would have been the end of the episode and you'd get the fucking music. Dun, 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 I don't know if that would be the music, but I'm just fucking saying it's an epic kind of cliffhanger moment just in that bit of dialogue that's mm, heavy hitting. This is why I love Baker. 
now popping back to Akami and Maimara and the Skin Eaters, this is actually, like, this thread is great. This, from beginning to end, it, all this part was fucking phenomenal to me. And just one hell of a journey. I loved all of that happened in Solages. And like I said, I really liked how we feel the just the weight of the aftermath of Solages right out the gate when we start the White Luck Warrior with our cast and crew here. And their descent into the mop was great. For one, I really applaud Baker in this series. His world building is just really ramped up and it's real it hits awesome. So it really is one of those like out of the frying pan into the fire thing by leaving Solages and entering the mop. Because the mop we know is not going to be good. And it's not. When we get into the mop, we, we discover a whole nother scalper crew. One that's even more dastardly than the skin eaters. Known as the stone hags. And they, they're fucking ambushing. Uh, they're ambushing the skin eaters. So this is really like, is it, if you don't have to worry about the shrink bad enough. Now you got to worry about your own kind as well. Because your own fucking scalp boy boys. Because they're kind of rough and ragged. They're, they're at a point where they're kind of left with no options. They're... They're scavenging, and even if they got to scavenge off of other scalp boys. So they are desperate men, which makes them almost more dangerous than already being a dangerous scalp boy crew. So the stone hags are now a big old threat. We're dealing with Shrank, you know, and this is the, probably the only thing that's keeping Maimara's arguments to a commune down to a minimum, because anytime she gets a free minute, she's definitely up his ass. Like, dude, why are you holding shit back from me? And there's plenty else going on here in this crew as well. Not just good old Sarl and his coffer cackling, which I fucking love. I'm going to talk about that repeatedly. The coffers, boys, the coffers. Ugh. So we still got crazy old Sarl. You got the captain, who's still very much a dickhead and a bit mysterious as well. And we have Cleric. Uh, in Cariel, who is the master of Mysterious, who is spouting off these cryptic sermons that just kind of feel like doom and gloom. <laughs> it's It doesn't really make you feel any more comfortable. In fact, I really like the part where it explains how several of the people, including a commune, lost a lot of sleep, uh, you know, over in Cariel and cl Cleric because he's just a fucking wackadoo. But as well as this, this thing with Cleric, he really brings that Kiri magic into the fold, into the story. And we're not so sure what the Kiri magic is, except for that it's keeping our crew going. They, they would not be able to continue on their fucking journey through such treacherous peril and just not stop, keep going without the Kiri. But we don't really know what the Kiri is, but the more we're kind of getting hit with it, it's starting to look like a drug. One that maybe our skin eaters are beginning to depend on too goddamn much, right? This is also the part of the story where Soma reveals himself to be a skin spy to Maimara. And this really throws a curveball into things. And I absolutely loved the thing called Soma. He actually reminded me a lot of Gollum, the way he's tracking them and whatnot. It was is good and creepy. And I love the fact that you get Soma defending Maimara. Basically, like, Maimara's life gets saved by Soma on multiple occasions. So it is strange when you think about this fact that the consult is somehow interfering to make sure that she's okay. And we also got, are starting to really roll in the fact that Maimara is also pregnant. And this is part of why her power, the judging eye, is, is really gone into effect. But Soma seems to be very concerned with Maimara's health as well as that child's and is willing to risk life and limb to protect her just to make sure she gets all the way to where she needs to go. And this is fucking awesome. It also brings forth into the fold the Synthes bird. Maybe you guys have been missing, you know, the baby baby heads on birds or whatever man head on bird action but here we get that and there's that other cool little spot where the synthied spurred mentions about the prophecy that they all need to come like full circle whether they're false or true and that's another just whoo mind melter because it really gets you spinning and thinking the other things I really enjoyed about this thread is just kind of the unveiling and the realizing of certain things. In my other review, I mentioned about how Akamian and Kellis are in a race. And maybe Kellis doesn't know, but Akamian does, and he's going for it. Well, in this book, we come to realize that Kellis does know he's in that race. Or at least he does know that Akamian's going for it. And that Kellis has eyes and ears everywhere, not just in the three C's, everywhere. And then when we 
come to believe, come to understand that Lord Kasoder is a true believer, it changes a lot of things here. We also are constantly trying to understand and flesh out this relationship still between Cleric and Lord Kasoder because it's not such a straightforward one, and we're trying to really grasp how this non-man came to be under the thumb of this, you know, just mortal man. And the mystery of Cleric and Cariel is unraveling in front of us as well, especially when he begins to open up, you know, dialogue between himself and Maimara, and we come to find out that he is no other than the last non-man king, Nilgikas. I think I said that right, hopefully. Sorry, guys. Anyway, this... Like I said, there's a lot of shit coming at you. A lot is being unveiled and revealed. And we see a commune bound and gagged. And he will spend the rest of this journey essentially as a prisoner. And no longer as the one kind of calling the shots and basically manipulating everyone. But he thought that he had everyone fooled. And now at this point, we've come to realize that he just... He didn't re know anything that was actually going on. And he's very much still in Kellis' control in some aspects. Now popping back over to the Empire, we will see that Esmanet does bring her brother-in-law, Mathanet, in front of her son in Relatus. And this is so that she can kind of understand his true intent. Is he with her or against her? But Mathanet shuts the door before Esmanet can enter, and it pretty much just traps himself inside the room with in Relatus and Kelmomis. And this... What happens is not exactly what you expect. I mean, it, it, for you guys that read it, obviously, I'm pretty sure you can agree with me. I don't know if you saw this shit coming. It, it's crazy because we get this back and forth between Mathanet and Inrelatus, and then Inrelatus basically points the finger at Kalmomus. He starts kind of like snitching on his little brother, but in this weird moment, then Inrelatus tries to kill Mathanet, and Mathanet only defends himself and kills his nephew. And then we see this thing turn into where Kelmomis tries to take this to his advantage and rat on Mathanet, saying, Oh, hey, mommy, he killed my brother, blah, blah, blah. Like he's trying to get away scot free. He knows Mathanet now knows his secrets, so, and he already has issues with Mathanet. So he's trying to squash that bug right now. And Esmanet believes her son, believes Mathanet just murdered uh, in Relatus and she wants Mathanet to pay but we see Mathanet gets away and then all kinds of just chaos ensues here in the fucking empire we see the tower burning Esmanet has to flee she goes into hiding it's just it's crazy really this this state of affairs is nuts and it really ramps things up for the reader here in moment this is also where we see Esmanet has hit a certain level of desperation where she puts out a hit on Mathanet she hires a Narender assassin but unbeknownst to her that Narender assassin is actually the white luck warrior now jumping back to the great ordeal we see Sorwheel and his relationship with the Scion, specifically Zaranga, has started, like, began to change. And that line that Zaranga feeds to Sorwheel about courage casting a large shadow is rather deep. And it really hit me hard. And this was, this was a nice, like, development in their relationship. I like how it kind of came full circle. And now the two who were, had been bickering basically this whole time, have really found a common ground, and they're on the same side. And Zaranga understands, he knows, because Sorwheel tells him about Yatwar, the mother, and, and these powers, and his slave, all this stuff. And so now, Sorwheel has a confidant in, in Zaranga, and Zaranga is more than willing to be there for him because he, almost, he feels like he owes him that debt because of that shadow that is cast from Sorwheel's courage. God damn, I love this shit. Now, this is also when we begin to see a lot of praise being heaped onto Sorwheel by men of the ordeal because he has saved a lot of lives. His work there by acknowledging the ambush, having his mandate schoolmen signal with light magic, it's just saved a lot of lives, and now they're beginning to appreciate him. And the, one of the things that happens in this, though, is when Cayutis is letting everyone know that their slaves are going to need to be put to death, and this is kind of an issue for Sorwheel, considering he's become kind of close to his, you know, unconventional slave there. And they have, you know, the, the mother and all that kind of connection. So Sorwheel brings his slave out to the, like, the battlefields, the dead shrank battlefields. And he's planning on just letting dude go. But what happens, we see 
uh, his slave does that little magic in the mud. We actually get to see like the mud turn into the mother and it's gross and dark, but also kind of beautiful in its own way because she is really chosen sore wheel. And that like relationship between, you know, the dread mother birth and her chosen warrior sore wheel is like I said, it's beautiful in its own way, guys. And the way it plays out is just awesome and heartbreaking because we see right after this, though sore wheel intended to let his slave go. Uh, we see his slave uh, Prosperian, right? We see Prosperian just throw himself onto the spear and it is, it's tragic in its own way, right? Like, I, I like Prosperian. I love this character. And I loved him being, like, the apprehensive slave, you know, that brought, brought the magic element into the fold for Sorwheel. Just throwing himself on the spear, it was it was heartbreaking for me personally. Like, some people might have found, like, the Lewith scene in the, ver in the first books a little heartbreaking. I feel like Prosperian was my, a little bit for me. Okay, so now I want to jump into kind of the Urshi River, Ursalor kind of part of this thread because this was a lot of fun, and I'm sure plenty of you will agree with, you know, Baker's battles are fucking awesome and amazing. Though this battle is so much different, and I noticed this. This kind of went through my head when I was like, holy shit, I didn't realize how much different it was going to feel when we were not fighting other humans. Because the Shrank aren't human, right? Like, we're fighting Shrank and Bashrag and awful, hideous fucking things, which bring their own dark and dastardly nature to themselves. But it does have another tone attached to that. These are not two human beings that just have faith so strong they hate each other. No, this is like a whole nother kind of fucking vibe, man. And honestly, like, parts of this are so fucking dark and when you really think about it because sometimes like when the shrank are overtaking people you're not just dying like you're being killed and your dead body's being fucked so like think about that kind of shit man can you imagine being on the battlefield and you watching your like best friend your brother whatever die fall and as you're trying to either you know make your way further into the battlefield or maybe you're trying to flee all you can see is his corpse being raped by these feral beasts well i shouldn't call them feral because we've discovered that they are somewhat intelligent right goddamn this is really where i see baker really just putting on display the difficulties of command and just you know the hurdles here on a fucking battlefield because a lot is going on you're being ambushed you know shit is just chaotic as all hell and you're trying to command these men and sometimes you might have you know, the foresight, or you might see something coming down the bend, and you're trying to relay that to your men, or maybe you don't have time to relay that to the, your men. Like we saw, he's telling his men, you got to take off your fucking armor, and the men are hesitant, right? But then later on, we find out the men that did not take their armor out, off were fucked, and the only ones that managed to flee were the ones that took off their fucking pieces of armor. But once again, just really try to envision this. Imagine you're staring down massive hordes of shrank massive massive never-ending hordes coming at you and your fucking commanding officer is telling you to take off your armor like fuck you buddy <laughs> but like i said so this is one thing i really just love about baker is he really hits you with some realistic aspects he will hit you with men that have the insight of battle they they know how to battle plan and whatnot but then he will also hit you with people that are too wrapped up in their own like ego or whatnot the, or people that are so sold on the fact that they are just going to win there's they're the good guys so they're going to win and we see the folly of those types of men another awesome thing about this thread is just all the magic that baker puts on display throughout I mean, we're really, as the reader, we're getting hit with something new when we get to see the witches step out onto the battle plane and just put on a fucking fireworks display from all hell. And you really how he displays them looking like frail, like rag dolls at times, but then just, you know, putting out this awesome amount of power is really fucking cool, man. And then also, you know, going back into the school of mandate and it's really cool that the fact that, you know, now today here, 20 years later, the fucking school of mandate is like one of the holy schools. Like they're no longer the fools that have, you know, that laughed at and stifled. No, they're like the closest school to the aspect emperor. 
And man, they're fucking powerful. And we see that whole thing play out on the field. I'm really like blanking the name of the other school, but they're what happens is the mandate and that other school go to fucking battle on the on the battle plane because one dude goes crazy. And that whole deal there is just nuts. Everything about this battle was just tragic for the great ordeal. Because even though they come out alive, god damn if they ain't super fucking beat back, man. Um, I do want to mention one thing, though. As far as with the great ordeal, you know, we were watching these guys struggle and go through all this shit and lose men at a rapid rate, or, you know, kind of give take here in the battle. But every time that Kellis shows up, it's like a clear win, man. That guy is so fucking overpowered. It's just, I guess the thing is, is he just can't be everywhere at once is the problem. Because I'm kind of, this was my, one of my only issues with the book is that, Kellis seems so goddamn powerful. It's almost just like, well, why don't you just fucking have Kellis run around the fucking battlefield and just fucking smoke everybody? And then, you know, on to Golgotharoth. Bouncing back to the Empire now and picking up with Esmanet, we see that she is in hiding. Her bodyguard hides her in his mistress's house. She is a, a whore. And this is something that's, you know, obviously very close and personal to Esmanet. It obviously makes her think not only about her current situation, but where she's come from. And a lot of this stuff kind of plays out. And we see that inner turmoil kind of perfect storm brewing inside of Esmanet, where she has a lot of things to reflect on. Well, during this time, though, we also see that she's betrayed. She's betrayed by her bodyguard's whore, and this is almost done in a very biblical sense. We see, like, the gold being th coins being thrown on the floor and then that piece of silver, and it is a very Judas kind of style scene. The bodyguard is killed. You know, his his mistress is, you know, screaming at Esmanet, don't, don't, don't tell the Aspect Emperor. I'm like, in this scene, I'm like, oh, ooh, you fucked up. You done fucked up. Huh. And from here, we see that Esmanet does not go directly to Mathanet. In fact, that she is almost raped. She's basically held prisoner for a little bit. And then when she finally does reach Mathanet, what kind of unravels... Man, I, I tell you, either you expected it or you didn't expect it. I feel like it. this was like a 50-50 mesh. Like I saw some things coming and I certainly did not see that last bit coming. So I kind of did envision these two kissing and making up, so to speak. And that's what plays out. I mean, when we get Esmanet and Mathanet in the same place, they're finally able to kind of get communication going and they're on the same page they realize what really fucking went down and right when they're ready to make amends like you know to shake hands bury the hatchet and make it like public too to like squash all the chaos and just be like no look we are together standing strong before that moment can happen out of the fucking shadows the white luck warrior kills Mathanet, stabs him in the fucking neck. And now Esmanet just thinks that this is the Narendra assassin that she has hired, and it is to some extent, but she doesn't really know the full extent of what is going down. But either way, Mathanet is fucking dead, and this shocked me. I did not see him fucking getting murked like that just out of nowhere. And I, I mean, I, I might have not have thought that he was going to live through this whole series, but this was not the point where I thought he was going to fucking fall. And I think one of the reasons why it was such a surprise is really because all the shit that Baker's kind of hitting us with during that like open communication between Mathanet and Esmanet, when they're both really coming to the realization that the Aspect Emperor you know, Kellis, her husband, his brother, has really just left them there to fucking die. It becomes apparent that the Empire will fail. It will fall. You know, Finale is out. He's at the door. He's He's got the wolves. They're hungry and they're howling and they're yeah, they got the scent of blood. They got the taste. This is a wild roller coaster for the reader. If you really think about the the series of events that all just happened in rapid succession, okay? You got two core characters that have been at odds with one another. And now they're coming together, and that is an anticipated moment in itself. But when they come together and they find a realization that a loved one of theirs has left them behind to die 
is boom. That's another thing that's just hitting you like what? And then that that basically works as the catalyst to form a new bond and their relationship comes back together, right? Now they're ready to make amends and stand strong together, shoulder by shoulder, and move forward as one. So that's another boom. It's like bam, bam, bam. All this shit is happening rapidly. And then boom, Nathanette, knife in the fucking neck. He's dead. Tragic loss to the fucking, you know, to the cast and crew, honestly. Like that's a big, big loss and if all that stuff wasn't enough hitting you one after the other then there's just the whole deal that goes down with Esmanette and her spilling the oil or what it was I think that's what it was called right spilling the oil where she just smears Mathanette's name immediately she does this to secure power because she knows that that those amends she just made that bond just like re uh crafted between her and Mathanet is gone it's out the window and the only way for her to survive and to grab power again is to fucking drag his name through the mud and that's what she does immediately without even skipping a beat but we do know that she's been trained by the best right by the aspect emperor himself kellis now it's also in this thread that we realize that kel momus is still alive he survives the burning tower he's out in like the secret hiding tunnels from what i understand correct and he is basically sniping off trial knights one after the other and eating them to stay alive and some of this like some like imagining this little kid like hiding in these little hiding places playing the most lethal game of hide and seek with trial knights was pretty dark and dastardly and I actually enjoyed this. And I, I want to throw a little shout out to you guys because, like I said, I love these Let's Talk things. And it gives me, you know, the chance to see some of your feedback. And you guys really, with some of the comments, help me kind of get back on board with these Anasa Rimber kids. Specifically, Kel Momis, when, you know, they just kind of pointing out that, you know, this is a kid that's part Dune Yane. And that shit's just running rampant in his head. And then his dad's not even there to help guide him at all. So he's just fucking in you know it's in a big way it's not his fault this is just the who he is inside naturally is a fucking nightmare you know blame the parents ha <laughs> but i'll get into that actually probably in my next review because i started to feel weird about judging kellis so we'll hold on to that we'll put a pin in that one for the great ordeal okay now i want to bounce back to sore wheel because i do want to touch on a couple things here in that thread before jumping into a communes and kind of finishing this thing up so when it comes to sore wheel there will there's that part where he is going to be separated from the great ordeal and I have kind of missed out on those parts where the non-men, where we saw the, the Great Ordeal was visited by non-men. And this is pretty big for us as the reader as the non-men are just goddamn confusing and mysterious as all shit. So Baker is starting to feed us a little bit more insight. And this is where we learn that the non-men are willing to sign up with Kellis and the Great Ordeal, but they want something beforehand. They want a little, like, assurances, so to speak. They want Kellis to take Dagliesh, as well as there's, like, this custom. It seems to be, like, a collateral custom, or, you know, uh, just a taking of hostages, so to speak, where they want uh, a son, a daughter, and an enemy. And so this is where Moengus, Surway, and Sorwheel get chosen to go with the not like to Ishtin Barrett, Ishtir, oh god damn it, Ishtirinbith, Ishtirinbith. You guys are laughing your asses off, but you know where they're fucking going. God damn it. Now their trip along the way is one that I definitely applauded as a reader because I think once again this gives Baker great opportunities to deliver on world building and he does we get good chunks of war, uh, lore and history as they're kind of leaping from place to place and we get to put eyeballs on it as well as we're kind of beginning to flesh some stuff out and and really begin to understand this power that Sorwil possesses against the Anasa Rimbers because kind of throughout this we're we're really getting kind of hammered with the fact that they can't truly see what Sorwill is like putting off. Like if he looks disgusted at them, they just see that he loves them. They see a true believer king when they look at Sorwill, regardless of what he's kind of putting out there. And that's this is the power of the mother. You know, this is her champion. So she is defending him against the threat, the Anasa Rimbers. And we're really seeing that shit play out when they're making these leaps because Sorway is just kind of confused 
with the treatment of Sir, uh, of Sorwill, like, why does he love her? Why does he love them so much? And she asks him this. And this is also one of those things where we're kind of understanding in some ways, Sorwill does seem to have some kind of feelings for Surway. I feel like immediately I felt that kind of, uh, some kind of confusing connection between these two from right out the get go, but it's really ramping up in these, this like leaping journey, but it's really convoluted when we find out that Surway and Moangus are sleeping with one another. And yeah, it's just fucking, it's a trip. Right. And that's funny because like sore wheels, like you guys can't do that. It's incest. And like, but it, we've been hammering the point home this whole time that Moangus is not Kellis's son and he's not Esmonette's son. So it's not incest at all. Regardless of all the craziness that's going on, we are really understanding as the reader how capable Sorwill is of just possibly being that weapon against the Anasa Rimbers. His power is truly working. They are being deceived. The deceivers are deceived. This is a crazy, like, revelation, realization for the reader because in all aspects, man, it just seems like there's no way in hell you're ever going to get one over on old Anasa Rimber Kellis. But Sorwheel seems like he got the juice. Now, the last thing I want to touch on in kind of this great ordeal thread is that li- like last bit, that scene where Kellis is talking to the men and, you know, we're getting this conversation about, you know, he's, oh, I've lied to you. I've told you there's less when there's been more and all this stuff because we're, we're going over, you know, supplies and whatnot and the, the, what we need for the, the, the army to survive, to push forward. And when the whole thing comes down from Kellis about how we're going to start eating shrank, like, that was a book, like, put the book down for a sec, like, what the f- Baker is wildin' in this one. And honestly, guys, I have to admit, like, this series is dark. It is dark, dark, and it continues to get darker. And and a lot of times, you might, just because maybe it's not being so smashed up in your face, and sometimes it is, but sometimes just it's a little bit off to the background. Or it's just so much is happening that you're not really having the minute to really digest and register how dark things are. But like I said earlier, like when you take a minute and think about the battle plan and think about this or think about that, and it really starts to set. It's just like, God damn, this is dark. This fucking book is dark. It feels like Baker was going through something. Like, <laughs> like possibly, like, somebody had pissed him off. I don't know if he was going through a divorce or anything like that. Uh, it is, it's pretty da- It's pretty damn dark. You know what I mean? Where the Prince of Nothing, it, it is very nihilistic. But this is just fucking straight up dark. All right, so now we're going to jump in and finish up with a communes thread. And before I really kind of get into it, though, I also want to mention something that had happened in this thread. And it's that part where it talks about how a commune comes to that realization that there are like two ghosts inside of him. And he talks about the one ghost that made a wager months ago. The one that made that wager to prove millions of people wrong and one lunatic right. And I loved this. This floored me. It really hit me hard. Obviously, I'm a big Naora fan. Like, so obviously anything revolving around him, I'm, I, I grasp <laughs> onto. But this really, you know, I had never even taken the time to think about that. Was that this whole thing is fucking held together by a madman's word. Bubblegum and duct tape hold shit together better than a madman's word. But I digress. Let's get back into this, especially before my camera dies. Okay, so I'm just going to put us at the Library of Saglish because this is where we've been working our way towards, right? Like, this was a Kamian's mission. He's trying to reach the library. He's trying to find the map to Ishwal. He's been lying to the skin eaters uh, about the fucking coffers and all the money and shit. And it's kind of funny because maybe I'm not supposed to still have ever have known the total motivation of the captain but for some reason I'm kind of blanking a little bit because it well after he he becomes kind of uh or shows himself to be a true believer I kind of wondered why did they let him go to the library of Saglish why let him go get the map 
when you could just stop him right there. And this, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to know or if I missed something. I don't fucking know, guys. Kellis is, you know, conniving. So I, I'm just kind of thinking that, you know, Kellis has a, a grander design than my feeble eyes read off the page. Anyway, I'm getting off fucking track. So the library of Saglish. So this whole thing, right, we see that the captain does not want to go in there. Like, basically, it seems like everybody thinks that you're going to die if you go up in there. And Akamian has been telling these guys about the wards and whatnot. And now that with the help of Maimara, he has grasped the understanding of who Cleric is, right? So he knows that he's Nilgikas. He knows he's the last non-man king, and he's hoping that he can get through to him because Akamian bears Seswatha inside him. So hopefully an old friend can reach an old friend, but he's got to get him alone. And some of this, like, ward bullshitting that he's doing has spooked some of these skin eaters, including the captain, and they get sent in by themselves. So this part of the book, I really, 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 really loved. I mean, it was fucking amazing. Soul blasting out of my body, my brain melt, all that. I mean, it was just so goddamn good. And the way that Baker breaks it up with the perspectives really adds tension because you're popping back and forth and each perspective is just fucking on fire there's no cold moment so is yes you're pulling out of one moment like like kind of cliffhanger ish but you're just dropped right into another barrel of fucking chaotic monkeys and it's all good baby both Maimara and Akamian's parts are you know they're sad they're heartbreaking and yeah they're engaging so, you know, with Maimara, we know at this state, it's only it's been a crazy ride with Maimara. You know, she has tried to get through to Akamian. She's tried to get through to Cleric. You know, it's it's been a tough ride. At this point, she's bald. You know, she's done whatever she could to kind of keep herself safe. Her and Akamian and the baby. And sometimes trying to get through to these crazy fucking non-men or scurvy pirate fucking skin eaters is not always an easy task. So here we are at the library of Saglish, like outside, and Maimara just obviously doesn't look anything like the Maimara that started this quest, and it's kind of sinister what plays out. The captain deal, this is like maybe the one part where you're kind of on board with the captain because he's the only dude kind of maybe keeping her from probably getting raped, but it doesn't matter because guess what? Captain... <laughs> fucking axed right we see the crew they fucking kill the captain and this is also during that time where it almost feels like the skin eaters have become rabid fucking kiri addicts and that might even be one of the main motivations for why they're losing their shit and and and, and fucking flipping the script on their captain even though it's been something that's somewhat been building throughout the journey it's gone fucking full crazy here and so the captain's fucking killed Sarl is in the mix, just spouting off his craziness, and now the remaining skin eaters are going to rape Maimara and probably kill her baby. It's just really fucked up, man. And you're 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 afraid for Maimara, you're afraid for the baby, but then we see the thing called Cull, like right? The the one stone hag that's made it through all this shit because they were dropping off at a rapid rate is actually the skin spy that was the thing called Soma. Once again, it is there to help fucking protect Maimara. But then we also see it get killed. And then fucking Sorrel cuts the fucking face off of it. You know, t singing some spider face song or whatever the hell, which it is old crazy way. This whole thing is just one nasty bloodbath of just horrible motherfuckers and Maimara in the middle. And then we got Akamian and Cleric and Cariel, Nilgikas. And Akamian knows that this is his true, his true name. He knows who he is, and he tries to kind of play with that as they're, like, in, this, in the library. And also the thing is that when they go looking for that map, it's not where Akamian expects it to be. So things are not looking good. And then when he's trying to open up this back and forth with, you know, one old friend to another, it really backfires on him. And this was something that kind of confused me a little bit, too. But I kind of laugh at myself right now because it's like, man, trying to make, you know, trying to make logical sense out of an erratic is maybe a little silly. It's, kind of, you know what I mean? I always tell people like, why are you, why are you trying to make insanity make sense? It's insanity. It's crazy. 
It don't make fucking sense. But either way, this like the the approach of a commune, like he tries to approach in Cariel, like from a place of love, but it backfires on him and it just kind of turns into this thing where Incariel and Akamian are at each other at in this moment, but that's not their big fucking issue. Because their big issue is this motherfucker smells like sulfur. <laughs> Raku. Now, up until this point, dragons or Raku have only been in like flashbacks or basically told in legends or seen as, you know, iron skeletons. But now... Ladies and gentlemen, a living, breathing, fire-spitting Raku dragon. I should maybe pinch back on the living, breathing thing because he is living. But we kind of find out that he's like barely living or he's dead and living. It's a weird, rotten state. One thing I loved about seeing this Raku and getting a little bit more knowledge into this weapon fucking race is that Raku's never stop growing. So the older they get, the bigger they get. They just never stop growing. So this is a big fucking dragon. And then they're like, oh, they can see that. They know know that right away. But guess what? It ain't just a big old fucking dragon. (laughs) It's the king of dragons. Now, dialogue begins to open up between the king of dragons and Akamian. And we see that Akamian offers him truth. And this whole thing that plays back and forth is amazing it's great it does remind me of smog and you know from the hobbit but it's also done in that baker way guys i don't feel like any of this shit is rip off at all in case if there's some if there is a critic out there that's like oh once again baker's just stealing from tolkien i, I say these things because i know there's assholes like that out there and maybe well you know maybe that's a harsh word for me Nah, fuck that you're an asshole anyway uh where'd i go, Where did I go? all holy hell breaks out after the discussion between akamian and the dragon king turns into a fight and cleric joins the fold this whole deal is such a sorceress spectacle it is amazing i Loved it. You know, a Baker is really proving himself to just bring an ending to a of a book in fashion. I mean, this thing was oh, it was mind blowing, guys. This is why I'm just shouting about how badass this book. I was already bought and sold all the way through this book. But then you give me this, you bring me this. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, I could kiss Baker because this shit blew my mind and honestly too guys i was rolling off of anna smith sparks books uh one that really reinvigorated my feelings about dragons so it was like perfectly timed to roll off of that into this and just enjoy it for all that it was because in cariel and akamian and the king of dragons put on a fucking show for the ages and nobody that reads this shit is going to disagree with me now i know i'm being a little bit ridiculous Because somebody will always disagree with me. But there is so much in this chapter, in this part, that Baker is giving you. And it's all so amazing, in my own personal opinion, that it's pretty hard for me to take you serious if you're saying, like, oh, it wasn't that good. Because, goddamn, it's the epic of epic. It's got some of the best dialogue between these characters in one of the most action-packed, magical, you know, destructive showdowns I've ever read. It's all coming at you guys, so how I don't understand how it couldn't be the coolest thing you ever fucking read. Just the stuff between um, Cleric and Wutiat, the King of Dragons. So Akamian has tried to barter truth with Wutiat. It hasn't really worked out. And then, you know, it looks like Wutiat's just about to say, fuck it, I'm just kill you guys and be done with it. And Cleric kind of steps into the fold. It's all kind of that craziness, the, 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 the back and forth. But what I love is like when Cleric is like, you will listen to my sermon. And then Wu Tia's just like, fool, my hide is bronze. My bones are iron. And then Cleric shoots back, you are blind. You are a beggar, a scavenger. You are a prisoner of your own spite. This is where Wu Tia spits cataracts of fire 
And the columns here in the library begin to shake, rattle, collapse, and just the chaotic atmosphere is really kicking up. And you got crazy cleric running around in circles, just like saying, If I die a fool, I die my own fool. You raku Jeroy. And Wutiat replies, I exceed my makers. Not even the black heaven commands me. Now amongst all this craziness, Akamian is beginning to understand that Cleric is buying him time. Time to get done what he needs to do. Akamian just isn't sure what that is just yet. But he's starting to call Kants into play. And really, you know, this dialogue that is still going down in between Cleric and Wutiat is amazing, guys. And I wish it was etched in stone so idiots like me would be able to remember it forever. But it does lay out some, like, world-building history lore aspects because we hear Wutiat talk about being, like, the first one off the arc, talking about how... Uh, they came from another place and where they where they came from they diminished the population down to the uh, 144,000 or whatever and it still didn't work and that this was supposed to be the promised land and all this stuff that's kind of spewing out of Wutia along with his fire is really blasting you in the face on many different levels. Eventually we see Akamian use his magic the Novorotic Spike Cant on the Dragon King hitting him in the shoulder and this really sends him into this like primal thrashing and whatnot and once again the reader is really plunged into this chaotic atmosphere with sounds of thunderclaps uh treasure being you know just erupting from the ground and everything and eventually our characters cleric and akamian are buried under said treasure Ugh. now they have to dig themselves out from this treasure and really it puts them in a sticky situation because there's really only one way out and Wutiat is waiting. It's basically a trap that's set and now Cleric and Akamian are going to have to work together just to get out and escape. Basically one is going to have to attack while the other one shields just so they can get through Wutiat's destruction. As they make their way through Wutiat's trap we once again are hit by Baker's amazing descriptive prose. I mean, he's talking about, you know, them being surrounded by boiling fire and rendering claws and spectral glass, spectral glass planes being shattered and rendered to ether and just like stones congealing like blood. It's just fucking beautifully, viscerally violent and just mm, 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 good. Then when Akamian and Cleric realize that they have Wutiat hurt, they concentrate uh, by attacking the head. And we get more crazy descriptions of just destructive geometries that are hitting Wutiat and forcing his his uh, bones to glow red and whatnot. Oh, God damn, guys, I love this shit. And just when Akamian and Cleric think that they have killed Wutiat, he smashes through their fucking sorcery crashes through the library and escapes out into the sky and flies away. Oh, fuck. You would think that this would be a cause for a celebration because things couldn't get any worse from here, but they kind of do. Because we see as Akamian tries to reach Neil Gikas again through the Saswatha and just, you know, trying to reach him from a place of love and victory and, and all this doesn't pan out while dealing with the erratic non-man and it just flips on him. And it doesn't, this is just, it's a sad state of affairs where we're watching two guys that we really enjoy reading about and we know that one of them is not getting out alive. And this is when Cleric begins with his sermons again and he's just spouting off the, the crazy blasphemies and he's gone into attack mode. He's attacking Akamian and this, he's really forcing Akamian's hand because Akamian doesn't want to attack Neil Gikas. He doesn't want to attack Cleric. He does not want this battle, but he is forced into it. And we see as as Cleric is just blasting Akamian and Akamian is summoning his cans and just ward after ward is dissolving and he's just using the ones that he can up with split second ease but he's also understanding that Cleric is coming at him a hundred percent like he's leaving himself open for Akamian to attack him in fact this is the situation that he's forced upon Akamian Akamian can either kill or be killed and this is what happens even though Akamian tries to still keep from killing cleric 
he does in the end. He tries to use a concussion can't, but the manner in which Cleric ends up falling and where he ends up falling, we see him, you know, get all ragtagged and burnt up, and he dies. But that moment, right before he dies, there's that little bit of dialogue between uh, Akamian and Cleric. And this is where Cleric's just kind of like sputtering out. He's just like, what? What happened? And Akamian's like standing over him. He's just like, you found glory. Oh, damn, Baker. Woo, just right in the heart, huh? And then to top it off, right before Akamian leaves the library, he's looking around and we get that like inner monologue of him kind of accepting like this is what is to come. Nothing but heartbreak and fire. And that is just oh, the cherry on top. So all that stuff I just talked about, yeah, that's all in that one chapter. So anybody that tells me that that wasn't exciting or it wasn't that good, Oh, oh man, I want to say go fuck yourself, but I'm going to be polite and I'll just say I politely disagree. Hmm? Also, there's actually more that goes down because we see Akamian leave the library and he stumbles upon the bloodbath that is the skin eaters and everybody. And the only one there is Sarl and he's clutching the skin eater face and it's just... He's spouting off his craziness, you know, being going to, they're all going to be princes, you know, the world's going to be their peach and whatnot. And he, it's sorrow. He's making me feel good with all his craziness. But then we get the reunion of Maimara and Akamian. They both know that they're safe. And really that, that moment when they reunite is really touching, actually. It's, and you really start to understand how much these characters care about each other. I mean, we, are, we knew that, but you really feel it in this moment because they have so much going on right now, especially between the two that's connecting them, and they're really going to need each other from here on out. And they are pushing forward. But before they do that, we see that they burn Cleric's body, right? They, they burn his body, and we see that his whole body re reduces to ash, nothing left but his Naimo armor. And they collect the ash, and that's like their new, their new Curie. They dump out the old uh, non-man king ash, which is I forgot to mention. That's what we found out that Curie was. Uh, so then they fill it with Cleric's ashes. And before they leave, though, they find Sarl's crazy ass, and he's got the captain's head, like, braided to his beard or whatever, and he's just being crazy old Sarl. I love him for it, and he is just be, being a bit of a creep. And, uh, you know, Akamian and Maimara are setting off towards Ishwal. Akamian finds the map. And so now they're going, they have their destiny, they're, they're going to set off. But before they do, it is kind of like, kind of touching an endearing moment. Like when Maimara catches the leaf, makes a little like envelope package, puts some ash in there, like some Kiri ash in there and gives it to Sarl before they leave. And I thought that was touching. Honestly, I just hope and hope, oh, I pray to Sejanus that we will see Sarl again. I don't know if we will, but... God damn it. I love his crazy ass. The coffers. Now it's in that very last little bit that we do see Maimara and Akamian do reach uh, Ishwal through the glacier and all that. The one part I do really appreciate about this <laughs> was when it talked about Akamian, like the mosquitoes being so bad that Akamian had to summon wards. <laughs> I was like, man, they must be in Alaska during summertime. <laughs> but either way, this does kind of wrap up this book very nicely for all the craziness that has happened. Well, all right, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this. This has got to be the goddamn longest video I've ever shot. It's taken me all fucking day. Hopefully you enjoyed it, uh, found it entertaining, informative, whatever. If you are a fellow Baker fan, a Pac-Man of sorts, and you got all kinds of information you would like to add to this discussion, or if I said something that you feel I'm egregiously wrong, feel free to correct me in the comments. That's what this whole thing's about, and so far, you guys have actually been very helpful. I normally like to go onto things like the Facebook Baker group and all that, but as I've been kind of devouring this uh, series, I've been very reluctant to where I tread okay i just don't want to spoilers you know what i mean i don't want to talk about spoilers for stuff i haven't read yet but by all means let's talk all the spoilers about the shit that i have all right all right <laughs> thanks guys till next time and hey if you're new please like and subscribe or if you it like you think somebody else might like it fucking show them I, i'm trying to grow this thing all right so till next time guys
Peace.